tonight, Canada finally lists Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist group. After years of mounting pressure, why now? And the concern about what happens next. For those who are in Iran right now, it's time to come back home. No relief from the extreme heat for millions as dangerous temperatures spread east and shatter records. I feel sick. I feel like I'm having a heat stroke. And where did all the gold go after the Pearson Airport heist? Where the stolen cargo went from this point is a mystery. Our investigation turns up unanswered questions why the case is far from solved. From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Canada is telling its citizens not to go to Iran and if they're in the country now, to come home. This after the federal government designated Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps a terrorist organization. The announcement comes a month after MPs voted unanimously for the designation. Now, any support of the group is a criminal offense in this country. The IRGC is a branch of the Iranian Armed Forces and responsible for shooting down flight PS752 over Tehran in January of 2020. Ashley Burke first broke the story for CBC News hours before the official announcement, and she leads our coverage tonight. After years of intense pressure, the government's now acting on a high-profile demand. Our government has made the decision to list the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist entity under the criminal code. That designation means police can now charge anyone who financially or materially supports the IRGC, which is a branch of the Iranian Armed Forces. And Canadian banks can freeze their assets too. This sends a strong message to Canada will use all tools at our disposal to hold the Iranian regime to account. It's a reputational hit against a group Canada says is part of a military alliance with Hamas and shot down flight PS752, killing 176 people, most with ties to Canada. This is very important to, to list them uh, and to call them what they are. For more than four years, victims' families pushed for this terrorist designation at every rally and event they held, Justice for Iran. including Hamid Ismailian, whose wife Parisa and daughter Rira were killed on the flight. It's very important to punish those people or those organizations that were involved in atrocities against Canadians and Iranians. The government was reluctant to list the IRGC in the past, fearing those conscripted who later fled to Canada could be impacted. We remain concerned about it. The Conservatives have been pushing for this since 2018. Because of the government's inaction over the last six years, the Iranian regime's capabilities here in North America have only increased. But the government says now is the time after advice from national security agencies. The government of Canada has concluded after a deliberative process uh, based on very, very strong and compelling evidence that the cabinet received that now is the time to list the IRGC uh, as a criminal, uh, as a criminal terrorist entity. The foreign affairs minister issued her own warning. For those who are in Iran right now, it's time to come back home. And for those who are planning to Iran, to go to Iran, don't go. Ashley, lots of questions here. Uh, what happens now and how do authorities prove that people here in Canada are affiliated with the IRGC? Well, Adrian, it's up to national security agencies now to investigate and lay charges if they have evidence, but it's not clear what that evidence is. The public safety minister wouldn't speculate how that work will be done or how many IRGC officials could be impacted in Canada. An expert I spoke with cautioned that what the government announced today is far too sweeping. He said that the, without new resources, this is going to be add a major burden to national security agencies, which are already completely overstretched. All right, so many things to chase yet. Ashley Burke reporting in Ottawa tonight. We're following breaking news in Labrador, where an out-of-control wildfire is forcing the evacuation of Churchill Falls. Smoke could be seen coming from those nearby flames. The community of about 750 was given until 8.15 p.m. local time to get out. Churchill Falls is about a three-hour drive from Happy Valley Goose Bay. One evacuee told CBC News there was a 45-minute warning to evacuate.
So we were all expecting the worst, and sure enough, at 7.30, we got text message and email notification from Forestry to evacuate and head east because the road is blocked to the west because of so much smoke. The MP for the area says the evacuation is going well. Buses have also been provided to get many people out. And in the United States, there are reports at least two people have been killed and thousands of others have been forced from their homes by two major wildfires in New Mexico. It looks like an apocalypse. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. It was absolutely the most scariest thing I've ever seen. One of the many accounts of what people saw as the fires approached a mountainous village in southern New Mexico. Authorities say so far about 1,400 homes and buildings have been destroyed. A state of emergency is in effect as crews struggle to get the fires under control. Now to the story. Millions of Canadians are living tonight. That relentless heat wave is still gripping a huge swath of this country and records are being shattered. So take a look at the heat today in Bathurst, New Brunswick at 37.6 degrees. That is the highest temperature ever recorded in Bathurst. Tonight, Kayla Housel shows us the widespread impacts of this first major heat wave and why health experts say it's just so dangerous. People flocked to the coast, packing beach parking lots, welcoming an early burst of summer weather. So amazing. I love it. But experts are warning the heat dome currently sitting over six Canadian provinces is cause for concern, especially because it's so early people have not acclimatized. These types of events uh, can have very severe impacts on, on health, uh, uh, illness, uh, and, and death. For people experiencing homelessness, a much needed water delivery. I feel sick, I feel like I'm having a heat stroke. In some areas, it already feels like it's more than 40 degrees with the Humidex, and that hot, humid weather is expected to stay in most of Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic Canada until Friday without even a break at night. All that moisture uh, during the day makes it hard for the temperature to drop off at night and we and to see any, any real reprieve. Toronto is dealing with transit delays because heat can cause tracks to soften and expand, requiring slower speeds. Montreal is approaching its all-time record for June, 35 degrees back in 1964. I'm not putting a lot of clothes on <laughs> so he can sleep. Like during the heat wave, I'm not going to be out for long, like maybe an hour or two max. Even those enjoying it know they need to be careful. Water, water, water. Environment Canada says such a heat wave has rarely been seen this early in June. I worry for my grandchildren. What is their world going to be like? In Halifax, these landscapers are calling it a day. It's too hot to continue. With the, uh, the Humidex, it's 52 right here. In Fredericton, this cafe owner is also closing early. The temperature is excruciating. It is really, really uh, hot in our kitchen. So we're going to have a nice staff beach day. Finding any way possible to beat the heat to keep everyone safe. Kayla, hard to miss you saying that these temperatures are hanging around. That's right, Adrian. For most of Atlantic Canada, Ontario and Quebec, this is going to stick around until Friday. For parts of southwestern Ontario, the heat will linger into late Sunday. Then when it's all over, Environment and Climate Change Canada will begin analyzing what took place here to try to determine by how much this event may have been influenced by human-induced climate change. All right, Kayla Hounsel in Halifax. Thanks, Kayla. New data is giving us a clearer picture of when heat can turn deadly. As Anand Ram shows us, just a small temperature increase can put a strain on our hearts. Shirtless, shaded, finding just about any way to cool off. As new Canadian data reveals what a slow-moving, silent killer extreme heat can be. The risk of dying tends to increase during days defined as extreme heat events compared to days that are not extreme heat events. Statistics Canada looked at two decades of data across major Canadian cities and found nearly 700 excess deaths linked to extreme heat events, including more than 200 caused by lung and heart issues. It's not surprising. We've known for a long time that excess heat is associated with a greater risk of mortality. At this lab in Montreal, Daniel Gagnon researches how heat affects the heart, using a bodysuit that normally keeps bomb disposal techs cool. It has tubes sewn into the material and we can circulate hot water to heat people up. 
What he found was even a small increase in body temperature has the heart working in a big way. Already at uh, half a degree or 0.5 degrees Celsius increase, almost all of the increase in, in the blood flow going to the heart had occurred. That stress on the body can be fatal. Worse for seniors and those with heart conditions. But the report also highlighted other vulnerabilities for renters who may not have air conditioning, as well as cities that don't typically get these extreme heat events. I think the heat dome really took people by surprise. During the deadly 2021 heat dome in BC, this cardiologist saw patients present with more heart attacks and strokes. He says, plan for the heat like it's a natural disaster. Can you stay at home? Is, do you have a cool area you can go to? Does your air conditioner work? If you can't stay at home, where do you go? Will you go to a friend's, you know, friend's house, family's house? As the continent rides through the heart of this heat dome, experts say the stress may go beyond the day as high nighttime temperatures provide little relief. Anand Ram, CBC News, Toronto. And hundreds have reportedly died amidst intense heat during the annual Hajj pilgrimage. Now, Saudi Arabia has not commented on the death toll, but Agence France Presse is reporting at least 550 people have died, many from heat-related illness. According to Saudi State TV, the temperature at the Grand Mosque in Mecca rose to nearly 52 degrees Celsius on Monday. Well, WestJet customers are anxiously waiting for news tonight of a potential strike at the airline. But as Aaron Collins tells us, WestJet is already cancelling flights and thousands of passengers are already feeling the effect. Fewer WestJet flights took off Wednesday. The airline grounded dozens of planes ahead of a potential strike affecting thousands of passengers at the start of a busy travel season. The union representing plane mechanics already picketing. It's nearly 700 workers could walk off the job Thursday evening. They say their wages are falling behind compared to other similar professions. We're starting to be overtaken by people that fix elevators and work on buses and things like that, and it just doesn't make sense to us. The airline and union had reached a tentative agreement, but it was rejected by employees. As a result, um, the process uh, has broken down. We've asked the government to help us to find a solution. Airlines are federally regulated, so Ottawa could step in, but Canada's labour minister says he hopes they won't have to. So uh, in the short term, there may be some flights disrupted, but I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that cooler heads will prevail. Some flights are already being disrupted. WestJet says it canceled dozens of flights to Calgary, Toronto, Edmonton and Vancouver scheduled for Wednesday and Thursday. That move angering some customers who quickly took to social media to vent. One passenger complaining that their vacation to Banff was delayed by 40 hours, adding that WestJet must pay for the disruption. And meanwhile, passengers whose flights will take off have different worries. My immediate thought is that it might affect our return flight on Monday. As Canada's busy summer travel season gets set to take off, the hope is WestJet and its mechanics can land a deal before any further flights are disrupted. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. To a terrible story now in a community just north of Toronto, where this morning a six-year-old boy was struck by a school bus and killed. Ioana Romiliotis visited a neighborhood in shock. It's heartbreaking when you imagine how the day started, probably like any other. A six-year-old boy on his way to school, killed in an instant. I'll be gutted, and it's, it's unexplainable. It is... Uh... Very tough to hear. I can only imagine how, uh, how the mother and father must be feeling. Police say the child was hit by a school bus just before 8 a.m. and was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators were visibly shaken. Bus driver has remained on scene. They are being very cooperative and obviously being assessed by EMS for the horrible, horrible scenario that they've been involved in. Anytime our officers, anytime um, first responders, any uh, EMS that come to a scene and see something that's horrible, dealing with a tragedy that just ruins everything for everyone. Witnesses say the boy was walking down this street with a family member when he ran across the street towards the bus that was making its way up the street. It all happened so fast that witnesses say it's hard to tell if the driver ever saw him coming. It was hectic. It was, you know, family arriving to the scene. You can hear, see their pain. 
It's not clear if speeding was a factor, but neighbors say it's a reminder for everyone to slow down. Kids love to play here, and they cross, they come across, they cross the road, kids, they always come, they want to go play, and the way the neighbor drive on this road. <sighs> ah, Jesus. Police say it's too early to discuss charges and say support services are being offered to first responders and the community, and especially to a family whose child is not coming home. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Kleinberg, Ontario. Baseball great Willie Mays is being remembered for what he brought to the game and the fun he had on and off the field. The Hall of Fame player died yesterday at the age of 93. As Lindsay Duncombe shows us, his legacy is ingrained in the sport. It was fun to watch Willie Mays play baseball. So much talent, remarkable skill, and joy. He had uh, power. He could hit home runs. But he also had amazing speed. He was like an antelope. And could he ever catch here famously over the shoulder at a full sprint? People talk about uh, the catch, and I don't understand why, because I did many things other than just, you know, catch a ball. Mays was from Alabama, where he played as a teenager in the Negro League. Four years after Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color barrier, Mays joined the Major League Giants in 1951. Years later, Mays moved west to San Francisco with the Giants, racking up astounding statistics. 660 home runs, 12 Golden Gloves, 24 All-Star Games. He was a, one hell of an athlete, a great ball player, great human being. Fergie Jenkins, the first Canadian inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame, knew Mays as a competitor and an All-Star teammate. He was always a guy that had a lot of one-liners, smiled all the time talking about the different teammates he played with and against. But he was, he was kind of the life of the party in the clubhouse. Still, being a black player in the 50s and 60s was not easy. The abuse was so heavy, so venomous, and it was time that he had to decide. And he looked at me and said, I didn't know if I wanted to keep doing it. Never overtly political, May's example of excellence, of humanity, became a catalyst for change. It's because of giants like Willie that someone like me could even think about running for president. Say Willie, say hey. A life of inspiration on the baseball field and so far beyond. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Protesters are calling on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to step down. He doesn't see anybody. He doesn't care about anybody. We're in Jerusalem where families of hostages are demanding a ceasefire. Canada is facing a big test against a soccer powerhouse. Messi, one of my favorite players. Are they ready? And the Oilers fan who may hold the crystal ball to the Stanley Cup. I just picked a random date. I was like, hey, 2024? Didn't even think twice about it. We're back in two. Well, the leaders of Russia and North Korea have signed a new mutual defense agreement. While the details aren't fully public, both countries pledge to help each other. North Korea has become an important ally for Russia in its war in Ukraine, supplying weapons. There are major concerns Moscow could help Pyongyang with its nuclear program. Well, to Israel now, where protesters have launched a so-called week of resistance, demanding Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declare a ceasefire and an early election. Margaret Evans is in Jerusalem for us tonight. With each setting of the sun this week, Israeli protesters have gathered in different cities, hoping to force a final sunset on the government of Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's great survivor, increasingly isolated, but still in charge of a country at war. It's very clear that the current government needs the war to continue to prevent election. He doesn't see anybody. He doesn't care about anybody. Israeli hostages still held by Hamas in Gaza are top of mind at the demonstrations. 
Many people want Netanyahu to agree to a ceasefire with Hamas to get them home. Demonstrators even made it into the Knesset on Wednesday. All of them, they're shouting. But a ceasefire isn't something Netanyahu's hardline religious coalition partners want. And analysts say he needs them to stay in power. He politicized the issues. So the hostages' families that are now in the streets are in his way of remaining in power. Ayala Metzger is getting ready for a protest in Ashkelon, sorting T-shirts that say, we're all hostages. Her own father-in-law, Yoram, died a Hamas hostage in February. We, we, we know that he's dead. We don't know how. Her mother-in-law was released in an exchange last fall. Metzger is lobbying hard to get the others home. She has no faith in the government to do it. They not available to, to do something. They can't manage a kindergarten. Sorry. Sorry. They can't manage a kindergarten. Protesters hope cracks appearing in Netanyahu's coalition will force its collapse. Others fear he's trying to hang on until July when Parliament will recess. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Jerusalem. The head of NATO was diplomatic when addressing Canada's unmet pledge of a decade ago to increase defense spending to 2% of GDP. Canada has increased defense spending significantly. I think the challenge was that back in 2014, when we made the pledge, Canada was at a very low level. Uh, so, so compared to some other allies, you have a long way to go. Jens Stoltenberg was in Ottawa to receive an award and meet the Prime Minister. Canada remains one of NATO's lowest spenders on defence relative to GDP. We know police have arrested multiple people suspected of a brazen gold heist at Toronto Pearson Airport, but many details remain unanswered. This is about how gold becomes guns. A CBC News investigation reveals buying guns may not have been the goal. Unless you are arming a militia, that's kind of overkill. And in the UK, the Tories are worried what happened in Canada decades ago could happen to them now. This has been a night unlike any other in Canadian political history. You could count Tory seats on your fingers. Will the UK Conservatives see the same fate? I'll throw that question at this week's panel. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. A group of environmental protesters targeted Stonehenge today, spraying it with paint. The incident happened just a day before thousands are expected to gather there for summer solstice. The group behind the stunt says the paint is made with corn flour, will wash away in the rain. Authorities say two people were detained. Well, Canada's national men's soccer team is set for another big international test. For the first time ever, the country will compete in the Copa America, and its debut match is a banger, taking on Argentina, led by the great Messi. Jamie Strachan is with the team. For Canada's men's soccer team, another huge international test. The Copa America features the best of South, Central and North America, and Canada starts off against arguably the best of them all. Canada, massive underdogs against Lionel Messi and world champions Argentina. The uniqueness of being having the global football spotlight on you, playing the best team in the world that has potentially the greatest player of all time, that is special. After failing to win a game at the World Cup, Copa America, the South American Championships, offers Canada another chance to prove itself as it prepares to host the World Cup in two years. If Canada wants to be competitive on home soil in two years' time, then they really have to be playing teams of this caliber on a regular basis of, the, of Argentina, Peru, and, and, uh, and Chile. Canada's roster under new coach Jesse Marsh, much the same as the World Cup, including international stars Alfonso Davies, Kyle Lahren, and Tejon Buchanan. But the biggest draw this week is Lionel Messi, global superstar. The sold-out crowd in Atlanta will include Messi fans from around the world, 
including this father and son from Vaughan, just north of Toronto. I'm from Argentina and I'm from Canada. And I met almost all the players in Canada, but I also met almost all the players in Argentina. And Messi is one of my favorite players. They traveled to Qatar to watch Messi play in the World Cup, making the much shorter trip to Atlanta an easy decision. I'd be happy with any just the fact that I'm be that I'm there and get to witness this this game that doesn't happen often with both my countries involved. It's a win-win for me. All hoping to see Canada put its best foot forward against one of the greatest players to ever play the game. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Atlanta. Now it's time to dig deeper into the story shaping our world. In a year chock full of consequential national elections, next up is the UK, set to vote on July the 4th. We'll look at a curious Canadian connection, but first. A multi-million dollar gold heist led to arrest, but also to a continuing mystery. Where is all the gold? Well, if I was a betting man, I'd say India. Police officials declined to talk to us, so our investigative unit did some legwork. Jonathan Gatehouse looks at just how much gold there was, how much it was worth, and the obstacles thieves would have faced in making it disappear. In the aeropuerto de Pearson, a las afueras de Toronto, in Canada. It put Canada in the international spotlight. The brazen theft of 400 kilos of gold from Toronto's Pearson Airport and the supersized news conference a year later, when police said they'd finally crack the case. We have arrested nine people, issued three Canada-wide arrest warrants. Project 24 Carat traced how a band of small timers allegedly spirited away tens of millions of dollars in gold using a plain white truck. Gold bars supposedly melted down by a jewelry store owner using a welding torch and a few simple tools then turned into cash, used to purchase 65 handguns. This is about how gold becomes guns. Stolen gold, melted by hand, sold to finance gun running. Police joking the caper worthy of a Netflix series, albeit one with plot holes you could drive a truck through. This is the place where all that stolen gold disappeared from view. A country road, about 30 minutes west of Pearson Airport. Police went to 225 homes and businesses looking for security footage, hoping to trace the path of a white truck, much like this one, only to lose sight of it here. Where the stolen cargo went from this point is a mystery. Just one of many unanswered questions about the heist, despite the arrests and celebratory press conference. Basic questions, like, What's the true value of the gold? Or the real extent of the link between gold and guns? Not to mention, what actually happened to all those shiny bars? Which has us wondering, have police really cracked this case? First things first, size does matter. In Hollywood heist films, gold bars are always big and heavy. Fort Knox, ha, it's for tourists. Police recently revealed that there were 6,600 of them. Each gold bar is 99.9% .9 pure. So a total shipment of about 400,000 grams in the form of 6,600 gold bars. Simple math then tells us that most of them were actually tiny. How small? About the size of a matchbox rather than a brick like this replica, easier to conceal or smuggle. Police say the bars were melted down, presumably to obliterate their serial numbers. But even when they're this small, it's still an awfully big job. Gold melts at 1063 Celsius, so it's a pretty high melting temperature metal. It turns out that melting precious metals is hard work and it takes years of experience to do well. Andrea Venkabach is a goldsmith who teaches jewelry design at Georgian College in Barrie, Ontario. You're 
always hot because the torch is always on. The light is very bright, obviously you need special glasses. Uh, here we wear um, canister masks because of the fumes. Um, the torch handle is heavy, so that's constantly in your hand. So there's a lot of heat. It gets uncomfortable. Venkabach says most jewelers just aren't set up to melt large amounts of gold. That quantity that you're, you're talking about, that would take days, days and days to do. Does it sound to you like this would have been a one-person operation? No, no. I mean, unless that person was doing it day and night, didn't sleep at all. And there's something else that doesn't add up. The value of the stolen gold. Police keep pegging it at just over 20 million Canadian. But based on April 2023 market prices, 400 kilos of gold was actually worth more than 34 million. And that value is still rising. Today, it's over $40 million. Then there's the gold for guns narrative. Pennsylvania court docs catalog all the weapons seized by US police. We looked up the price for each gun. Most cost around 500 US dollars. In total, all those firearms could be legally purchased for under 50,000 Canadian a tiny fraction of what the stolen gold is worth. 400 kilos of gold is a lot of gold. That is an awful lot of guns. Um, unless you are arming a militia, that's kind of overkill. David Sood is an expert on how criminal organizations use gold to finance their activities and hide their profits. He says the link between the stolen gold and gun running sounds dubious. If you want to discreetly bring a large number of guns from the United States into Canada, um, there are better ways to do it than by staging a spectacular airport gold heist that's going to have multiple law enforcement agencies hunting for you very aggressively. And then there's the $34 million question. What happened to all that gold? All of our officers are dealing with gun crimes. Peel police crimes. have recently said they the believe the gold is no longer in Canada. So where in the world could it be? Well, if I was a betting man, I'd say India. Alan Martin studies the flow of illegal gold. He's convinced that the missing cargo is now overseas. When I did research there a few years ago, uh, almost a, a between 25 and 30 percent of the of the market was was illicit and and or they didn't know where the where the material came from. The thing with India is you could you could literally hide a truckload of, of gold in India and nobody would notice. Indian consumers love gold, buying almost 750 tons last year alone. The cultural affinity we have towards gold uh, makes gold a very very attractive commodity for smuggling. Najib Shah used to be in charge of India's anti-smuggling efforts, a tall, if not impossible, order. And India's uh, uh, coastal borders are extremely challenging, which means it comes into the, uh, into the, into the land and get, get, it can get transported to the marketplaces almost instantaneously. Marketplaces like this, Zaveri Bazaar in Mumbai, some call it the world's gold capital. 20,000 goldsmiths packed into a square kilometer. Every day, an estimated 500,000 people come here to buy or sell gold, and few questions are asked. Police don't get involved. They are not allowed to get into the shop. Customer comes and buy the gold. Customer comes and sell the gold. The police won't know it. A no-tax, high-profit gamble, one that this shop owner avoids. There are few jewelers are there who buy smuggled gold only. If the 34 million in stolen gold ended up in this warren of shops, the trail is now cold, meaning someone somewhere made out like a bandit. And Toronto's great gold heist remains far from solved. Jonathan, there is so much more to this story. I'm so curious, what are, what are police saying about everything you've figured out? Well, not much. I mean, we asked Peel Police for an interview. They declined our request. And they also declined to answer the written questions that we sent them. They were citing their ongoing investigation and the criminal trials that will eventually get underway. 
But you know, they don't want to answer even basic questions like what were the size of these gold bars or the true value of the shipment. So we also reached out to Valcambi, the Swiss refiner who made the gold, as well as Brinks, the security company that was shipping it to Canada, and TD, the bank that purchased it. And again, nobody had any real information to share with us. So yet another mystery why even the victims are reluctant to talk. Okay, well, thank you for continuing to push for transparency. I know you're not going to let go. Jonathan Gatehouse. Thank you. A right-wing political campaign in the UK is looking to Canada for inspiration. What happened in Canada was reform did a reverse takeover of the Conservative Party. The lessons for the Tories as the UK gets ready to vote. Our world panel is next. as you join the CBC's coverage of Election 93. I'm Peter Mansbridge. This has been a night unlike any other in Canadian political history. The Liberals, who've held power almost 64 years this century, are going to hold it again. You could count Tory seats on your fingers. That progressive Conservative loss is still considered the worst ever electoral result for a governing party in the entire Western world. Kim Campbell's PCs went from a majority to just two seats after losing votes to the Liberals and new parties like the Reform. Fast forward to today as the ghost of that old Canadian election haunts the UK's election, maybe it could happen again. And just like what happened here, the UK's Reform Party is fighting the Conservatives for votes. Its leader, Nigel Farage, using Canada's election in 93 as a playbook. What happened in Canada was reform did a reverse takeover of the Conservative Party. I don't want to join the Conservative Party. I think the better thing to do would be to take it over. So the UK election is just two weeks away. Let's break down why it's being called a game changer. CBC's Chris Brown is in London, in Ottawa. Former CBC Parliamentary Bureau Chief Rob Russo, who's now with The Economist. Chris, uh, I understand the 93 election was your very first, one of your very first assignments. You know that race. You also just spoke with Nigel Farage. I did, yes, just yesterday, and he talked uh, with admiration about Preston Manning, the founder of Canada's Reform Party. He said that is where the name Reform UK came, uh, comes from, and that he's going to try to follow Manning's blueprint, first win a couple of seats in Parliament and then springboard past the Conservatives in the next election before eventually doing what he called a reverse-engineered takeover of the Conservative Party. Now, Farage, I think, has some advantages maybe that Preston Manning did not have. He's not a new face in the UK. He's a political disruptor who two decades ago formed the UK Independence Party and helped push Britain out of the European Union. He's also, I would say, a showman who a lot of people remember for being stranded in a jungle on a British reality TV show. Okay, so now I feel, Chris, like everyone's going to retreat to Googling that episode. So the last time the Labour Party won an election, this man, Tony Blair, was in charge. The Conservatives have now been through an awful lot of Prime Ministers, five consecutive leaders. So there has been some chaos in the Conservative Party, to say the very least. But how accurate is it to compare it to Canada in 1993? Uh, Rob, like Chris, you covered it then. Don't be mad. We have a picture of you on the trail. In 93, let's have a look. I want to assure alarm viewers <laughs> that that's 1993 and not 1893. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think about that comparison, Rob? Does it make sense? Is, it, is this a fair conversation to be having? There, there are some similarities. Let's go over the differences first. Uh, a key difference is um, uh, Kim Campbell was actually ahead going into that election campaign, even her ahead. She brought the Conservatives back from a nadir of a low point of 12% to actually be ahead uh, during the first week of the campaign. Not the case with Mr. Sunak and the Conservatives in the UK. I think the other difference is that the Progressive Conservatives here in Canada in 1993 <coughs> faced a bilateral threat from both sides. Uh, a party was made up of alienated Westerners who joined Brian Mulroney and Nationalist Quebecers, and both those elements of the party had turned on Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Sunak faces more of a threat from the right on one issue in particular, it seems, immigration. Those are the differences, but the similarities can be striking. We have both leaders, Mr. Uh, Ms. Campbell and Mr. Sunak, are breathtaking change. 
uh, we have uh, a stumbling campaign. Kim Campbell stumbled out of the gate, even with that advantage, made some key errors early on. Mr. Sunak seemed to have made a very key error, particularly uh, a couple of weeks ago in Normandy. Um, they're facing not exactly exciting, charismatic leaders, but people who were considered safe hands, and Mr. Chrétien, uh, and uh, in terms of the, the labor leader as well in, in the UK. And the other, I think, striking similarity is that the voters in both instances were exhausted after rambunctious, uh, a, a cacophonous change. Okay, beyond the exhaustion, Rob, let's have a look at, at what you said, because I want to look at some of the numbers we're talking about. The Canadian Progressive Conservatives in 1993, this was them before the election. But after that election, look at what was left. You have to need a microscope to find the two seats that they ended up with. By comparison, <coughs> let's look at the UK right now. So this is the UK Parliament before the election, all that blue, those are the Conservatives. This is what's expected to happen to them after the election. A lot less blue, a lot more red. So Chris, Rob mentioned exhaustion. I think all, all voters can understand that. You've been out on the campaign trail with Nigel Farage talking to voters. What, what do you think seems to be driving their decisions right now? Well, we were in his riding on the uh, Essex coast a couple of hours from London. Heard a lot of complaints about immigration, as Rob said. Also, cost of living and the challenges, for example, of buying a house. Labour has had a big lead in practically every poll for the last year. But Keir Starmer is not offering sweeping reforms, rather incremental moves like spending more money on health care to reduce waiting lists, hiring more teachers and police officers. And he says he's going to pay for all of that with targeted tax increases on things like private school tuition fees. So to many people, that doesn't sound like a real hard left agenda, like, say, former Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn proposed. So right now, Keir Starmer probably doesn't feel like he has to take many risks just to protect this lead. Uh, you know, one of the things we keep talking about in the newsroom is how many elections are happening around the world this year, more than at any other time in history. We just saw the EU election. There was a swing to the right that feels like a trend. But here we're talking about an election w where a left-leaning party is projected to make some really big gains. Rob, why is that? Well, when you have uh, high inflation, high interest rates, um, frustration, it's a really good time to be a leader of the opposition. And what we're seeing is that populism isn't exactly or strictly a right-wing phenomenon. There are elements of it on, on the left. I, I think what we're seeing is after 30 years, let's say, since the 1993 election, we've had free trade agreements, globalization, we've had the digital revolution, and we've had people who used to be able to get jobs in Western countries at factories, come out of there with good pensions and benefits. That's no longer the case. They feel left behind, and now they want their house, they want their picket fence, and they're ready to turn on anyone who hasn't given them that for the last little while. Uh, and, and so they'll go to agents of chaos when necessary in, in some Western countries, and in other countries, they'll just throw the bums out. Right, because I suppose, Chris, I mean, any time a party's been around for a long time, people just obviously just crave change. Presumably, that is also what is at work here, too. That's right. Don't forget the signature policy of the Conservatives was Brexit. They took Britain out of the EU, and now the sense here is that the economy is in worse shape, and so are many uh, public services, for example. example. Uh, Labour leader Keir Starmer, he's not flashy. He's probably even a bit wooden, acts like the former Crown Prosecutor that he is, and the Conservatives have cycled through so many Prime Ministers. You've named them all there. As, as Rob said, Starmer likely feels at this moment like a pretty safe pair of hands. All right, Chris Brown, Rob Russo with the story of the ghost of Canada 1993. Thanks, you two. Thank you. Next, a yearbook quote Oilers fans hope will come true. I truly think it's prophetic. I think it's a prediction. I think it's real. The prediction many are rooting for in our moment. Oh my God, on top of the world. Oilers in seven, 100% of the way. Oilers fans went wild after Edmonton beat the Florida Panthers in game five, and at least one fan is sure the Oilers are going all the way. In fact, he predicted it back in 2018, left it as his yearbook quote. His graduation prophecy is our moment. David, 
Bears. They're just going to win the Stanley Cup this year. I'm confident. When I was graduating high school, I remember just thinking, what am I going to do for my yearbook quote? So I was like, hey, how funny would it be if I predicted my favorite team in the world, the Edmonton Oilers, of course, to win the Stanley Cup? Flips it back to McDavid, swings wide, takes the shot, scores! I just picked a random date. I was like, hey, 2024? Didn't even think twice about it. So yeah, it's right there. Edmonton Oilers, watch it happen, 2024. Scores! What a brilliant piece of work! McDavid to Perry, and it's 4-1. I'm confident. Uh, it's not about when it becomes true, it's when it happens. In alone, looking for Shorty, scores! Score! I would just love to see the Oilers win in game six, coming back to Rogers. I truly think it's prophetic. I think it's a prediction. I think it's real. You know, dreamers dream. Totally, the whole country is counting on this. Uh, we're all going to be with you, Edmonton. In fact, Ian will be hosting the National from Edmonton for Game 6. He's very jazzed, as are we. From all of us at the National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.